Hey guys, thanks for checking out this week's message. At Hope City, we're always so encouraged to hear how God is bringing the hope of Jesus to people through this ministry. If God has used this ministry to bring hope to your life, we'd love to hear about it. To share your story, you can email us at lifechange at hopecityonline.net. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can simply text any amount to the number on the screen. It's a safe and secure way to support the work God is doing here at Hope City. Now, let's prepare our hearts for a message out of God's Word. Today is going to be kind of uh, knocking the rust off, um, if you will. For those of you that aren't aware, it's been about four or five weeks since I've had the opportunity to teach here at Hope City, which may not sound like a long time to you, but to me, it's like an eternity. And the reason it's like an eternity is because last year I did 48 out of 50 weeks. And so I was consecutively teaching um, all of last year and got really used to that just being my Sunday morning routine. And so for the last several weeks, I've been waking up on Sundays going like, I don't know what to do with myself. This is really, really weird. But took a few weeks off to get reset for the fall, and I'm really excited to be back here hanging out with you guys. I am beyond pumped for where God is taking us this fall, what we're going to be talking about this fall, what we're going to be teaching this fall. I believe it's not a good idea. It's a God idea. I believe it's not something that we planned. It's something that he planned and then let us in on his plans, and so I'm really, really excited to be able to share with you where we're headed this fall. For the next couple of weeks, though, we're going to be in kind of a mini series leading up to one of our fall growth series, and this series is called Lies We Believe, and the premise behind this entire series is I'm just convinced that there are certain times, particularly and and almost especially in um, churches like ours, where we kind of settle into things that are true on face value, and they become very quickly lies that we build our entire reality around. Let me explain to you what I'm talking about. One of the things that's a big deal here at Hope City, it's a staple here at Hope City, it's part of our mission statement at our church, is that we are a church for broken people. If you're jacked up and you're broken, like you're a perfect candidate to be hanging out here at Hope City Church. And one of the things we say is that for those of you who don't think you're broken, just hang out for a while and God will reveal some things in your life that maybe you didn't even recognize or realize was broken. But we're convinced that we've all got jacked up spaces and parts of our life that desperately need the hope of Jesus to be poured into. And so because of that, we talk a lot about our brokenness. We talk a lot about our insufficiencies. We talk a lot about our shortcomings. And all of those things are true. True. The problem is so often we settle into that reality and begin to assume it's normal for the follower of Jesus to be jacked up, to be broken, to be messed up, to be just a sinner saved by grace with all of his shortcomings and all of his warts and all that other junk. And what ends up happening is when we settle into that reality, we take something that's true and all of a sudden build our life around a lie that was never intended for a follower of Jesus. And now, what we've done is we've bought into a lie from the enemy. Did you know that the best way that the Bible describes the enemy is someone who is a deceiver in your life and in my life? So what he does is he takes something that's true, something that's good, and he twists it just a little bit to where all of a sudden we build our lives around something that's not true at all. And I'm watching it happen more and more, not just in our church, but in the modern church in 2016. And so what I wanted to do is take a couple weeks and just address who it is that I believe that God is calling us to be, uncover some of these lies so that we don't settle into them as reality for our lives and then hopefully become the people that ultimately God is shaping you and me into becoming. Now, to do that, we're going to look at one particular passage of Scripture that this entire series is based around. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to be picking it up in verse 3. So if you've got your Bibles, I'd love for you to go ahead and flip over there. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, picking it up in verse 3. If you don't have a Bible, the verses are going to be on the screens for you. However... Man, I would love for you to have a Bible of your own that you could study for yourself, that you could take notes in, that you could circle, that you could highlight. Um, We don't want you taking our word for it on the weekend. We want you studying God's word and having an intimate relationship with him all throughout the week. And so when you walk out today, you can stop by our resource center, pick up a Bible free of charge. It'll be our gift to you. We'd love for you to have a copy of God's word before you walk out of this place today. Also, 
Um, I wanted to make you aware there's a lot of really, really practical and helpful resources when you're out there at the Resource Center. So while you're out there and you're grabbing a Bible, make sure you stop by and take a look. That stuff's not just there for show. We definitely want you guys to have it and to be resourced um, to be able to walk fully devoted as followers of Jesus. But for the sake of today's um, context, you can follow along on the screens or look on your smartphone or your tablet. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. The Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church in Corinth. And if there's anybody who could settle into the reality of I'm just messed up, I'm just jacked up, I'm screwed up, I've got a past. If anybody could settle into that reality, it's the Apostle Paul. Because the Apostle Paul has probably one of the most checkered and jacked up stories of anybody in the scriptures. The reason is, is because this is a guy who literally murdered and terrorized. All right, I don't need to lie. We can talk. We can talk. Murdered and terrorized Christians for their Faith. People who were followers of Jesus were killed for being followers of Jesus. Their, their kids were killed, husbands and wives were killed, all by this guy named Saul, whose name later became Paul, simply because they were Christians. And so if anybody had a right to go, we're all jacked up, we all need a second chance, we're all messed up, we fail every day, it's the Apostle Paul. But for some reason, that's not what we see him doing here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He says this, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Even though we live in the world, we don't, we don't deal with our struggles. We don't deal with our, our shortcomings. We don't deal with our pain. We don't deal with our issues. We don't deal with the onslaught and the attacks of the enemy the same way that everybody else does. We don't handle our business the way that everybody else does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary... They have, now watch this, divine power to demolish strongholds. That's awful different than the language that we use in the 21st century church, isn't it? Because when we talk about strongholds, we say everybody's got strongholds. Everybody's got vices. Everybody's got habits. Everybody's got addictions. Everybody's got things. And you just come just like you are, and God will love you right where you're at, which for the record is completely true. But we settle into this reality that these strongholds are just a normal part of the life of a believer. And the Apostle Paul's going, no, 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 no. Don't you for a second think that your addictions, that your vices, that your struggles, that your issues can become normal place in your life. You need to know that God has equipped you with weapons that are far different than the weapons this world uses. And God has divinely possessed in you an ability to not only knock a dent in the strongholds that you face, but to demolish the strongholds that you face in your life. The issues, the struggles, the addictions, those things do not have to be commonplace in your life and mine as a follower of Jesus. Why? Because we've been given the ability to demolish those things. Yeah, but, but we've all got them, don't we? But we've all, we all still deal with that stuff, don't we? And when we say things like that, you know what we're doing? We're living in the reality of the lie we believe. For the record, this is not going to be one of those amen sermons. This is not going to be the one that you like want to tweet, and it's not going to be super encouraging. Because what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about how many of us have settled into a normal which is not normal for the life of a believer. And it will require us to do some serious soul searching. It says this, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But as followers of Jesus, we have doubts and we have struggles and we don't just wipe that stuff out. But the Apostle Paul says you can and you should. Well, then why do I still have doubts and why do I still have struggles? Because we have bought into lies which are so far from the truth but sound so good when uttered on our lips. And it says, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Do we do that? 
I mean, let's be honest. Like, the thoughts that people can't see, the thoughts that people don't know, do we take every one of those that don't honor Jesus and we immediately take those captive? Or do we ponder on those thoughts? Do we settle into those thoughts? Do we think about those things? Do we rest in those things? Of course we do. We all, if we were honest, would say, if anybody at this church could see behind the curtains and saw my thought life, I could never show my face here in this church again, right? But yet we're followers of Jesus. The Apostle Paul's follower of Jesus. And he's writing to followers of Jesus. And he's saying, you don't have to live that way. That doesn't have to be normal. You can take those thoughts captive and they can be made obedient to Christ. You read a passage like this and it sounds impossible, right? It sounds, if, if nothing else, it sounds impractical. But the reason it sounds impossible and the reason it sounds impractical is because the lies we believe determine the reality we live in the lies we believe determine the reality we live in so if we believe that we're just we're always going to have these thoughts and we just believe that we're always going to give into these vices and we believe that we're always going to struggle with these doubts and we believe those lies then that will become the reality that we live in and so anything outside of that will seem impossible or irrelevant or at the very least, impractical. We say things like this, living like Jesus is impossible for you and me because he was perfect and we're not. And the idea of living like Jesus sounds impractical and impossible because the lies we believe have shaped our reality. I'm, 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 a, I'm a failure and I'm just going to fail every day. Yes, I know Jesus loves me and he forgives me and by grace I am healed, but I'm going to mess up and I'm going to fail every day. Really? Do you have to mess up and fail every day? Well, yeah. Well, show me that verse. Show me where the scripture says that Jesus died to save you and redeem you from one thing and then put you right back into it. Well, we can't find that verse, but we say it. And why do we say it? Because it's our reality. Because we have bought into these lies that we believe. So here's what I want to do. For just a moment this morning, I want to make two pretty general and broad statements, and then we're going to unpack these statements over the course of the next week or two. But I want to make two statements, and both of these statements are true. The problem is they don't line up with the lie that we believe. So I want you to write these down. I want you to circle them. I want you to highlight them. I want you to come back and look at them later. And the reason is because when you walk out the doors of this place today and you face life tomorrow, you're going to be tempted to believe that these statements aren't true. But trust me, they are. And when we get these right, it will totally change the trajectory of our lives. Statement number one is this. A holy life, a holy life is fueled by habitual thought a holy life is fueled by habitual thought you and me here's what we say holiness is impossible on this side of eternity holiness is not something to be attained holiness is not something to be grasped jesus was holy he was set apart for the work of the father but for you and me there's no way we're going to be holy because because we're living in a jacked up messed up broken world and we're just never going to be able to meet that standard and let me say to you this truth this morning a holy life is attainable, but it is only attainable when it is fueled by habitual thought. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. The Apostle Paul says this to the church in Philippi. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, do these things. Is that what it says? No. What does it say? Think about these things. And then he goes on, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. But how do you go about putting into practice a life of holiness? How do you go about putting into practice a life that is good and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy and true and noble and right and pure and lovely? How do you live that way? It doesn't start by what you do. It starts by how you think. 
If you are constantly thinking about your failures, if you're constantly thinking about your insufficiencies, if you're constantly thinking about the times that you screwed up and that you're going to screw up in the future, if you're constantly thinking about how much you mess up in this life, you're going to continue to fail and fear and mess up every time you can. And the reason is is because it's what has consumed your mind. But... But, and this is a big but, this is a huge but, it's like a Kardashian-sized but right here, right, right, but, (laughs) I'll hear about that tomorrow, (laughs) while a holy life is fueled by habitual people, by, by habitual thought, a hellacious life is also fueled by habitual thought, a holy life is fueled by habitual thought. And a hellacious life is fueled by habitual thought. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7 says this, For as he thinks within himself, so he is. Whatever you spend your time pondering and considering and thinking about, that is the reality you live in. And this is not the power of positive thinking. This is the reality that every sin you commit starts in here. And everything that you do on behalf of God and for his kingdom starts in here. That's why in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. If your mind isn't transformed, you will conform to the patterns of this world and live out what this world offers you. Romans chapter 8, verse 5, says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. I want you to see something here. These two statements are absolutely true. The problem is we don't live them out. And the reason we don't live them out is because we assume the lies that we've been taught. I want you to see this. Faith and failure are both driven by one thing. Focus. If you focus on your failures, if you focus on your insufficiencies, if you focus on your shortcomings, guess what? You're going to be insufficient and you're going to continue to have shortcomings. If you focus on who it is that God is calling you to be and transforming you to be by the power of his spirit and the shed blood of his son, you will begin to overcome strongholds. You'll You'll begin to be people who take thoughts captive. You'll begin to become people who demolish the enemy's work in your life and mine. But these verses sound so out there and so far from being attainable in our regular Christian lives, maybe for the super Christian, but in our regular Christian lives, these verses seem so far out there, but they're not as far as we think. The problem is we've focused on all the wrong things. We've focused on who we were rather than who it is that God's calling us to be. And we will never live out 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 6, if we don't stop taking our eyes off of our insufficiencies and instead start fixing our eyes on the sufficiency of Jesus. This is not just an individual problem. This is a church problem. The body of Christ, man, we're really, really big right now. And listen, I'm not shying away from it. We're not going to stop. We're not going to stop who we are or what we're doing or what we're about because there are people who desperately need to know that Jesus will meet them right where they are. But I'm just convinced that there are too many people who've been followers of Jesus for 1, 2, 3, 10, 15, 20 years that are still resting in who they were rather than stepping up to who it is that God's calling them to be. And so we're not going to shy away from that message, but we're not going to buy into the lie that that message is where it ends. Instead of fixing our eyes on who we were, instead of fixing our eyes on our insufficiencies, instead of fixing our eyes on our shortcomings, we're going to start fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is far greater and far more powerful to overcome whatever it is that we continue to struggle with. And as we fix our eyes on him, he'll begin to change our behavior. Why? Because fear, failure, and faith all stem from and are all fueled by focus. I want to read to you another passage of scripture that I'm sure you've heard a thousand times if you've been in church any length of time. But I'm hoping that this morning, based on this reality, that you'll see it in a new light. 
It's Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll pick it up in verse 1 and roll through verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, since there are so many people on the other side of eternity and on this side of eternity that are watching our lives for the kingdom of God, let us throw off everything that hinders all these thoughts that get in the way of us focusing our eyes on Jesus, all these thoughts that get in the way of us living out who it is that Jesus is calling us to be, all these thoughts that keep leading us towards um, addictions and vices that we can't seem to demolish or overcome. Let's do this. Let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin which follows, by the way, the sin that so easily entangles those things that we get caught up in, that we mess up with, the things that we have settled into as normal for us as followers of Jesus. No, 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 no. No, 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 we're not going to live in that reality anymore. We're going to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. I've been a big fan of the Olympics. Whenever the Olympics come on, I'm always a huge, like, I'm one of those weird people that get addicted to the Olympics, even though I could care less about the stuff that happens um, leading up to the Olympics for the other three years of our life. But, but during the Olympics, I'm a huge fan. And I listen to the huge runners talk about their journey. And what's fascinating and interesting when you hear these runners talk about their journey they never talk about their insufficiencies they never talk about their shortcomings you know what they talk about their training their work their effort their time their energy they put all their focus on one thing what's the one thing running the race and winning the race. What do we do as followers of Jesus? We take our eyes and focus off of running the race and instead focus on our insufficiencies and how we're not good enough and we're not strong enough and we're gonna keep messing up and we're gonna keep screwing this thing up and we wonder why we keep screwing this thing up and we wonder why nobody out there wants what we have in here. It's because we're living the same way that they are. And God's desire for you and for me is to get to a place where we throw off all this stuff that hinders us. Throw off all the sin that entangles us and instead run the race with perseverance. How do you run the race with perseverance? I'm so glad you asked because look what it says in the very next verse. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Not on you, not on your mistakes, not on your failures, not on your fears. Stop talking about that stuff because every time you talk about that stuff, you get drugged back down into that stuff. What you need to do is fix your eyes on Jesus and look how it describes Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. Does this mean that if you walk out of here and you say, you know what, tomorrow I'm not going to think about my shortcomings, I'm not going to think about my insufficiencies, I'm going to focus on Jesus. I'm going I'm to focus on him, have my eyes, my attention, my thoughts. I'm going to direct all of my thoughts to him. I'm going to fill my thought life up so much with Jesus that there won't be room for any of this other stuff. If all that happens, am I going to live a perfect life tomorrow? No, but you'll be better tomorrow than you were yesterday. You'll be Way better tomorrow than you were yesterday. Why? Because Jesus is in a perfecting business. The problem is, just like with stories, all too often we don't give Jesus the room to work in our life and perfect our life because our focus is on our life and not on him. There are, um, in, in, in theological terms, there are three separate parts that all work in conjunction together to our salvation. I'm going to throw out three big churchy words and then I'll explain them. There's justification, there's sanctification, and then there's glorification. Let me explain what that means. Justification is that part of salvation that evangelists love talking about, that pastors love preaching about because it's good preaching. It's where everybody says amen. It's where people get excited. It's where tears start streaming down people's faces. It's where there's a drastic change. And here's why. Because justification is when God says you are justified by your faith in the grace of my son and his shed blood on the cross. You are justified in my eyes, meaning you weren't justified before. You were lost and dead in your sin, but because of the work of Jesus, you have now been justified. You're no longer guilty, but you are innocent and you're wearing the badge of innocent. And I see you as perfect and holy and blameless. And now when, when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees the work of his son on the cross. And now you have the literal, like literally you have the blameless and 
spotless reputation of Jesus over your life. And there's nothing you can do to earn it. And there's nothing you did for it. It's all by the grace of Jesus. And that's good preaching. Like that's, that's the good stuff, right? That's justification. And the other thing that we love talking about is this, this third part over here, glorification. This is what the Baptist church loves talking about all the time. This is the part when this life ends and you're no longer separated by flesh and blood. You're no longer separated by the brokenness of this world. And you get to take your relationship with God that you started in this world and experience it in all of its glory. Hence the name glorification. That's when you're given a glorified body and you're in the presence of God for all of eternity. And people love talking about heaven, right? Like I remember growing up in the Baptist church, it would like every third song we sang would be about heaven. Be describing heaven, streets of gold, pearly gates. All the southern gospel groups would come through and they'd sing about heaven. People get all excited and start dancing and waving their hands. People love thinking about heaven and they love thinking about grace. But the problem is we spend way too much time jumping from justification to glorification And we miss out on this big part, which is a big deal, which for the record, the majority of the New Testament was written about, and that's sanctification. That's when God is sanctifying us or cleansing us or causing us to look more and more like his son. Why? So that we can be better than everybody else? No, so that we can make a difference for everybody else. God wants to use people, but he can't use people whose lives are jacked up just like theirs. I don't know about you, but my role models aren't people who are just like me. My role models, the people that I want to be like, those are the people that have it together more than me. My financial role models are people that are richer than me. My, my, my fashion role models are people who dress nicer than me. My fitness role models are people who don't have this and are muscular, more muscular than me. Right? People who have it together. That's all right. We're going to get it together one of, one of these days, right? These are my role models. Why? Because they're not like me. The reason that so many people outside the four walls of the church don't want what you have is because they hear you talking a lot about justification and they hear you talking a lot about glorification, but they ain't seeing no sanctification. And they're saying, if that's the Jesus that you serve, I'll just stick with what I got. Why? Because we've settled into and focused on our failures and our insufficiencies rather than who it is that Jesus is calling us to be. Like, like Jesus saved you, but he didn't just save you from something. He saved you for something. He wants to mold you and make you into the image of his son. He doesn't want you struggling with that addiction just like your buddy at the shop is struggling with that addiction. Why? Because he wants you to overcome that addiction, to demolish that addiction, to be able to take that addiction out in such a way that you can go and now serve your buddy at the shop who's struggling with it. He wants to sanctify you. And somehow we've bought into the lie as followers of Jesus that this is good and that is good, we ain't gonna really talk about this because we're just sinners saved by grace. No. No. You are not a sinner saved by grace. That's a great song and people love to sing it in church world, but I don't see anywhere in the New Testament that tells me that you and I are sinners saved by grace. Just in case you're wondering, at the point of justification, we no longer carry the badge or the honor of sinner on our shirt. Now we are a saint of God. And a saint of God living in a fallen, broken world, yes, will still mess up and will still sin. But when they do, their eyes are so fixed on Jesus that his sufficiency overcomes their insufficiency. Their conviction is so deep that they won't ever make that mistake again. And tomorrow becomes different than today. But the struggle that I have as a pastor is I watch way too many people settle into tomorrow looking just like today. Tomorrow looking just like today, and then the next day looking just like today, and then the next day looking just like today, and then what do we do? We point back at justification and say, but it's okay. It's not okay, because God saved you for more than that. 
God does, listen, if you weren't going to be sanctified and you weren't going to be changed and God wasn't going to redeem you and heal you and make you whole and cause you to become a different person than you were before, the moment you were justified, he would have just taken you out and brought you home, but he didn't. You know why? (laughs) Because he's got a purpose for you. But you'll never live out the purpose that God has for you as long as you live in the reality of the lies you believe. That this is normal. That these thoughts are okay. That everybody's doing it. It's just okay because of the culture we live. And it's not. God says, I've called you to be a holy people. Set apart for my good works on the earth. And when you settle into the reality of the earth, you're no longer set apart. I told you this one wasn't tweetable. This one's not, oh man, that was good. No. It sucks. Because this is where the fun's all removed, right? Because we can't just settle into living like we were. But you know what? I've watched this happen time and time again. People lose who they were to become who it is God wants them to be, and that's a difficult and hard transition. But who it is that God wants them to be has such influence in the world around them that it's a far better place to live than they could have ever imagined before. Is it going to be easy? No. Is it going to be difficult? Absolutely. Is it going to be something you're going to have to wrestle with and struggle with and try for and attempt to do? Yes, because you are wrestling against the lies that you've been told your entire life. But if we can get to the place where we stop focusing on how insufficient we are and start focusing on the sufficiency of Jesus, stop focusing on the grace to cover our sins and start focusing on the grace that frees us to be saints, we'll start turning the world upside down. All of a sudden, people will start saying, I don't know what you got, but I want it. I don't don't know how you live that way, but I want to live that way. I don't know how you think like that, but I want to think like that. I don't know how you walk and talk and respond like that, but I want to be able to walk and talk and respond like that. And you know what we're going to be able to do? We're going to be able to point the finger at Jesus. People, I said this in the last service, and it almost sounded heretical, but just hang with me. People aren't interested in our message. They're interested in our reality. But if we can show them a reality that's a better way to live, we'll get to tell them about our message. Because that message is what gives the breeding ground for our reality. So my challenge to you is to ask yourself the question this morning. Have I begun somewhere along the way since choosing to follow Jesus? Have I began to believe the lies that my thought life and my vices and my addictions and my shortcomings and my struggles are just normal and it's okay because it's covered by grace or if I begin to demolish those strongholds and fix my eyes not on who I am but on who Jesus is how do you specifically do that next week we're going to talk about it So I want you to be here for week two of Lies We Believe. Let me pray for you. We'll get you out of here. God, thanks so much for the power of your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. And as much as it sometimes hurts, thank you for the conviction of your word. God, I pray that we would be people who are so radically different from the rest of the world not just by what we will or won't do or where we will or won't go or say or won't say, but so drastically different on the inside that it begins to show up on the outside that people want what we have. God, that's our heart, that's our hope, and that's our prayer. Make us people who look like your son. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.